Okay, I'm really on a roll today, so this will be my second recording. Um, now we're going to be talking about protein synthesis. So we've gone through replication of DNA, transcription, and now we're on to RNA, which is the translation into protein times from nucleic acid to amino acids. And just for basic review, this is what your standard amine looks like. You have an, uh, your amino acid has your amine group, a hydrogen on your central carbon, a carboxyl group, and an R group. Oop, I'm terrible at this now. Okay, so translation is a complex factor involving greater than 100 factors. Okay, so the first amino acid has a free amine group, which you'll find up there at the top, the N-terminus. Um, this is obviously your growing peptide chain, and the last one has a free carboxyl tell, C-terminus, C for carboxyl and for amine. Okay, so this is non-overlapping and it's non-skipping. The major players to be concerned with is the mRNA, the amino acids themselves, tRNA, the amino acyl tRNA synthetase, uh, ribosomes, rRNA plus proteins, and protein factors for initiation, elongation, and termination. Okay, so protein synthesis is controlled amide formation. tRNA structures and charging, which is adding the amino acids to tRNA. There's prokaryotic ribosomes and protein translation, eukaryotic ribosomes and protein translation, and protein, tra protein translation antibiotics. Okay, so let's look a little deeper into the tRNA secondary structure. Okay, so tRNA is an adapter molecule, so the amino acid site and the anticodon on opposite ends has the amino acid site and the anticodon are on opposite ends. So each tRNA is 73 to 93 ribonucleotides, mostly base paired in a cloverleaf pattern, similar to what you're seeing here. Um, contains many unusual bases, often methylated versions of GUAC. Things like this. Uh, the dihydrouracil loop, which is important there. These are all the things you want to look for. Obviously the 3' prime cap with the CCA. Do remember from the last video that that was switched from what was there previously. Uh, and then we have the, the pseudouracil C loop. And then there's an extra variable arm, which can sometimes be longer than others depending on the uh, tRNA. And of course we have the, T, uh, the anticodon loop at the bottom as well. Okay, so here is a 3D structure of the tRNA. So you create sort of an L shape. You have your C terminus, your uh, E. Oh, excuse me, let me double check my loop name. Yes, yeah, so the pseudouracil loop and the dihydrouracil loop there. And as noted there in the thing, it is, there is the extra arm as well. Um, each arm is composed of two heli helices. Um, the min, the ma uh, this maintain adapter conformation with amino acids uh, attachment site and anticodon loop. So that main so this maintains adapter conformation with opposite amino acids attachment site and anticodon loop. Okay, so let's get into the basic chemistry of amino acids and how they're occurring and what's happening where, where and when. Okay, so amino acids are activated for protein synthesis by amino acyl tRNA synthetase. So there are very there are quite a few of those amino acyl tRNA synthetase. They are very specific. Um, okay, so to start out we have activation. You have an amino acid plus ATP. It becomes phosphorylated, which gets amino acyl adenylate, and then which is what you're seeing the amino acyl adenylate. And then uh, you add the tRNA molecule and lose the AMP, which means you have amino acyl tRNA. So what you'll see there is you have the adenyl, adenine, adenine. Well, in this case, we have adenine. Okay, and then we notice that the amino acid attaches on the 3' prime hydroxyl of the tRNA. So, See it up there on your, on your, yeah. And that's where your attached site is, which is going to be, if you want to look at it closer, it's going to be 3 prime there. 
touches there. Do, 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 do. Yeah. So that's where that attaches. Okay. Each amino acid tRNA synthetase must specifically bind only one amino acid. So uh, these enzymes each activate a specific amino acid so that it can bind to a specific tRNA. So the enzyme mechanism at the bonding, binding site is a very small little area right there, you see. So that's 3-anil tRNA synthetase. So that's designed to fit only 3-anine, not valine or serine or anything else. Um, it uses size exclusion and bonding exclusions. Okay, so these enzymes each activate a specific amino acid, uh, like we see here. So the amines there interact uh, correctly there with the amino acid tRNA synthetase. Okay, so continuing to look at the same image, we're getting a little bit more information now. Uh, the valine doesn't have a hydroxyl, so no bonding with zinc or uh, extra hydrogen bonding as well. And then it can, def uh, can differentiate between the serine or threonine because it has the OH group additionally that you don't see. has uh, has the, yeah, the extra OH there, which is not on the same on that one. Okay, so you just know that there's a difference because you can tell the difference in size and in uh, control groups on the uh, various amino acids. Okay, when necessary to discriminate between similar, uh, when is it necessary to discriminate between similar amino acids, TNRA synthesis have evolved proofreading ability. So you have the active site and you also have an editing site. The editing site cleaves uh, the sur tRNA, but not the thr tRNA, which is the shearing versus threonine tRNA. Hydrolysis by impeded by the uh, sterics of the extra uh, carbon, excuse me, carbon group on the end. Um, if you note that it sees that's the three and tRNA synthetase error rate versus sur is improved. The general rule is the size exclusion. Bigger ones are excluded. The editing site removes anything smaller. So. You see it goes through. If it's proper, it'll go out. If it's not, it'll go to the editing site and be removed. Okay, so the synthetase binding of the tRNA must also be very specific. The specificity of the synthetase is due to the interactions with the tRNA anticodon loop, which is what you're seeing down here, and the acceptor stem, which is up here. And sometimes there are additional sites. You just see a few up there. So you notice that the two are bound together up there. Okay, and that's a good point to mention the degeneracy of genetic coding. Uh, what that means is that uh, each each different uh, you know sequence G C U C A G uh, they all code for the same uh, alanine uh, amino acid. So what that means is it helps prevent uh, additional or or I guess you could say you could say problem problems within the coding itself. So just of note there, just want to keep that in mind for future use there. Um, okay. So does every specific genetic code need a specific tRNA? Uh, and the short answer is no, they don't, because you can match up a different one and you can still get the same sort of growing peptide chain. As long as it's closest within the same area, it should bind out just fine. Okay, so something to look out for, the uh, incorporation of inosine in the anticodon. The inosine, cytosine, cytidine base pairs, or the inosine, uridine base pair, or the inosine, adenosine base pairs. Um, so the anticodon CGI can uh, bond for GCC, GCU, or GCA. So, like I was saying previously, multiple things could bind at the same site, just depending on what additional things um, are on the anticodon loop there. Okay, so again, we just see it comes in there, so CGI could go in there, and as a result, allow this to bond there, because it would allow it to. Otherwise, it would not have normally allowed it to. Okay. So let's talk wobble base. It, well, can't click today. Okay, 
uh, wobble base theory. The, the first two bases in the codon triad are read with great fidelity through the Watson-Crick hydrogen bond pairing. The third base is less, less faithfully read. This usually leads to incorporation of the same amino acid. Uh, does every genetic code need a specific tRNA? No, it does not. So UUA, UUG, CUU, read by the same tRNA, read by a different, and that one is read by a different tRNA. So those two, because they're A and G, they read the same. So codons that differ in either of the first two bases must use different tRNA. Um, does every amino acid have only one tRNA? No, there are multiple tRNAs for all the different amino acids. Okay, so protein synthesis is controlled amide formation. So let's go through some of those real quick. Uh, again, we're back where we were. The tRNA structure and charging, prokaryotic ribosomes and protein translation, and we'll be getting into eukaryotic ribosomes and protein translation a little later. So right now I think we're just going to stick to topic one, which is tRNA structure and charging. Okay, um, so the ribosome is a ribonucleoprotein, which is two-thirds RNA and one-third protein. The ribozyme is another name for it. It's still the same thing. They're very large in size. They're 2,700 kilodaltons, and they're about a quarter of uh, the cell's mass there, cell's total mass. Okay, so and then you'll notice the side of the peptide bond formation is a little tiny spot right there in the middle of this huge conglomeration protein ribosome. Mm, RNA complex. Okay, so the ribosomal subparticles, um, at least in eukaryotes, are composed of a 50s large subunit and a 30s small subunit. Uh, the 50s large subunit is composed of 34 proteins, L1 through L34, and large 1 through large 34. Uh, that has 23s and the 5S are RNA, and that assembles spontaneously. The small subunit is 21 proteins, S1 through S21, small 20, or small 1 through small 21, as uh, 16S are RNA, which interacts with the Schein-Degano sequences, and that also assembles spontaneously. Now, the ribosome, which is the combination of the small subunit and the large subunit, is only 70S. Please note that 50 and 30 equals 70 in this case. <laughs> um, and S is the sedimentation size and shape, shape and conformation when, com uh, when combined. And this is assembled only when the protein is made. Okay, so let's go into a little bit more. The ribosomal rRNA uh, has a 16S secondary structure uh, from the small sub. This is the 16S secondary structure from the small subunit that we're talking about here. Um, forms, a com forms a complex duplex or structures with multiple stem loops per domain. So you notice many stem loops per domain area. Uh, the base pairing, base pairing between single-stranded bases stabilizes tertiary and quaternary structure, which is what you see here with the extended forms there. Um, the magnesium ions also help with the stabilization. It also serves both structural and functional purposes. Uh, many antibiotic protein, many antibiotics bind to rRNA to inhibit protein synthesis in pathogenic bacteria. So this is just looking at it this is in the tertiary structure there. Okay. So here's an L15 RNA and L19 uh, RNA. This is again part of the large subunit of the. Uh, completely forgot the name, of the large <laughs> large subunit. There we go. Uh, they often have an elongated structure. The elongation allows for insertion of various molecules, things like that, um, or amino acids, I guess would be the better term for it. Uh, many primarily serve as structural role to help maintain the shape of the large subunit. Um, proteins interact with the backbone of the RNA, but not of the base. Um, they primarily interact with the RNA sugar instead of the base, so just to make that clear. The ribosomal proteins primarily interact with the RNA sugar phosphate backbone instead of the base. Okay, so the ribosome has three tRNA binding sites as the amino acyl site, which is the A site, the peptidyl site, which is the P site, and the E site, which is the exit site. 
So every amino acid tRNA goes to the A site except for one. So everything starts here, moves over. Uh, the P site is where peptidyl tRNA and it's where the bonding occurs. Uh, they go up through this, uh, they come in through this complex, and then the newly bound amino acids come up through this tunnel in the top of the 50S unit. Okay, so as you notice, it comes through the tunnel at the top. Uh, oh, sorry. The majority of the mass is RNA and not protein based. And do note that the catalytic site is composed primarily of RNA. And that's where we're going to stop for now, and we'll get into the mechanic mechanics of protein synthesis next time. Okay, thanks.